Hello and welcome to the uh, IMAF weight management panel discussion. Um, I'm Michelle Verokan. I'm IMAF's anti-doping advisor and director of sporting integrity. We thought it would be interesting to actually take a, a focused look at the issue of weight management in sport. I mean, we know that weight categories are there to try and level the playing field, um, make competition safer. But we're also very much aware that weight cutting is one of the biggest issues in athlete welfare in a variety of sports, not just in mixed martial arts. Um, so we thought we'd like to talk to some others outside in the world of sport to understand how they see weight cutting, but also to take a little bit of a deeper look at it from an MMA perspective. So we hope we're going to conclude with some recommendations for more safe and effective weight management. But before we get there, we want to have a, a really good examination of the issues. And joining me uh, on stage here um, are uh, the following really high quality speakers. So welcome Paula Radcliffe, MBE, British Olympian, long distance runner, previous holder of the Women's World Marathon record. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Also, Dr. Mike Loosemore, Commonwealth Games Chief Medical Officer, Team England Boxing Doctor, former AIBA Medical Commission member, and member of SAFE MMA. So you've got experience from amateurs right through to the professionals, Mike. Welcome on board. Then also from the United States, Dr. Randa Bashron, who's a member of our IMAF Medical Commission, a ringside physician for the Nevada State Athletic Commission, USA Boxing uh, for IMAF, and also the US Navy Mutai Association the American Association of Professional Ringside Physicians. So thank you so much for joining us, Rhonda. Thank you very much, Michelle. And finally, Clint Wattenberg, who's Director of Nutrition at the UFC Performance Institute, a former wrestler in his own right, but uh, joining us today with a, a hat uh, to nutrition. Thank you, Clint, for joining us. Thank you. Now, at the end of the panel session, we're going to hear from Kerith Brown, who's the president of uh, IMAF. But first of all, I want to turn to our panel members uh, in order that they can help us unpack this whole issue. We're going to start from outside the world of MMA. Paula, if I'd like to br uh, bring you on stage and, and ask you, as an athlete from the sport of track and field athletics, you know, what's your personal experience of the issue of weight management in your sport? Well, I mean, I think I'm very lucky in that within our sport, it isn't uh, as strict or as problematic uh, as in other sports that we, we saw on the video to begin with. Um, but certainly there is a correlation there um, between healthy weights and a minimal healthy weight and stronger performances. Um, but there is also a huge issue particularly in amongst junior athletes uh, and athletes developing from those junior ranks into the seniors uh, of, of anorexia and of eating disorders. Um, and I think growing up, I think I was extremely lucky to, to be surrounded by excellent coaches, excellent support amongst my family and amongst my team to, to talk about those issues uh, and to recognize that certain athletes that maybe were beating me for short periods of time were not healthy and we're not going to be able to sustain that and to understand why and that's why I think the education issue is a hugely important area that coaches understand how to express those difficult conversations properly and athletes hear the right messages and go about finding a healthy way that's going to give them the longest and most successful career. So, Paula, has your position on weight, the weight management topic changed since you were a young athlete? And, and, and how would you describe the culture in athletics now? I think there's a, a much greater willingness to, to talk about it now. Um, I think before there was almost a, a shame and a, a stigma attached to athletes that had 
issues um, with their with their weight and with their body images. Um, and now there's a lot more help out there. I think there's a lot more help from physiologists and from nutritionists to really talk with athletes and to explain um, those myths that used to surround events like the marathon, that the lighter you were, the faster you were, don't really exist so much anymore um, because there is now that greater understanding that actually if you don't have muscle mass, you have nowhere to store the glycogen in and you won't perform as well. So it's about finding that healthy weight now and it's the education around that. But I do still think it's a minefield out there for, for coaches, particularly male coaches to female athletes, to be able to express properly um, and responsibly to those young athletes how to find a weight that helps them to perform well but which is healthy and sustainable for them and that won't get them into the kind of red territory that we hear so much about. Okay so if I ask you the blunt question is it necessary to drop weight to be a winner how would you respond? I would respond with it's necessary not to carry excess weight um, but I don't think it's always necessary to, to drop weight. For some athletes, it might be necessary to actually gain weight in order to perform better. I, I think what is necessary is to understand the individual athlete, their physiology, and at which weight they perform best. And that's something that my physiologist helped me with a lot over the years, is working out what was my ideal body mass to perform well, to perform strongly, not to get injured and to stay healthy. So... How might we persuade athletes and their support team, as you've referred to, that you can be a world beater at a healthy weight? What are your thoughts? Well, I, mean, I think if you look back over history, certainly within my sport, but probably within other sports as well, those that don't maintain a healthy weight don't have the longer career. So I think it is about that learning and the education and pointing to those success stories. And it, it's rare that an athlete with an eating disorder will have a long, sustained, successful career. Um, and I think making sure that young athletes understand that before the damage is done, that's the, the key area because too often, sadly, those athletes realize but it's too late to regain the strength in their, their body had to begin with. And of course, it creates that culture of expectation. Now, I wonder whether you've got any thoughts on what federations themselves should really be doing to address this, because we've got the, the athlete, we've got the coach, but is there something federations could be doing? Absolutely. I mean, I think it comes down to the federations to educate and to protect the athletes and the coaches. And in sports where that weight cutting, that weight dropping is really prominent, there I think there need to be proper rules in place to make sure that the athletes and their health is protected. That is the most important thing. So be it changing the way that weigh-ins are to maybe make them, I don't know, a little bit more often, more regular so that athletes aren't dangerously playing with their body to, to hit that weight to so then gain it again before the actual fight or competition happens. So have you seen things improve in, in athletics? Um, yes, I've seen, uh, as I've said, a, a, be a better willingness to understand all of the issues that go around weight management, particularly for young female athletes, the influence on their menstrual cycles, on their fertility and, and later health. I think there's a lot more understanding around that. I think there's actually a lot more understanding on the wider nutritional field about the type of, of nutrition that you need to get into your body, a type of fuel that you need to get into your body to fuel performance in the best way, particularly in events like the marathon, where that needs to be very much understood. I mean, that's a fantastic message from, from your perspective and, and understanding, obviously, with the longevity of your career, um, how it's possible to to be able to do that so um, I'm and I think it's important as a mother too uh, and as a mother of a, of a teenage girl that mm -hmm. their, their, their welfare is looked after and is first and foremost because they don't get that opportunity again so we have to look after them. No I mean it's, that that's an absolutely critical message that you've sent there. Um, I'm going to come back to you Paula but I'm going to move on um, to Dr Mike Loosemore um, hello, Mike. Well, your your experience, obviously, over the whole sort of sporting pathway from uh, youngsters coming into uh, the sport, particularly boxing that you're involved with, but also you're very uh, much aware of uh, 
how we operate in, in MMA, um, but right through to the professionals. And uh, you're obviously seeing things from the perspective of the single event and also the multiple day events. Um, as an experienced medical uh, specialist in this area, you know, what what do you see is the the, um, the the key issue with weight management in the preparation of fighters? I think for me, Michelle, the the key issue is that you've got to you that that a healthy weight is a good weight. So yeah. if you are if you try to lose too much weight or if you uh, do not put enough energy into you, you will underperform. So having a good uh, a weight management strategy and boxing at, or fighting at the right weight is key to being a successful uh, fighter and also it's the key for as Paula said a key for longevity over a career so if we've got the terms coming forward the right weight and the healthy weight then you know to a certain extent why is it we're seeing um, these rather drastic you know acute weight cutting um strategies um being you know sort of embarked upon well it's you know it's always been the case that uh, that weight is a, a huge advantage in combat sports so if you can fight somebody at a heavier weight then you will have an advantage so people are always looking to try and gain that advantage the dif difficulty is, of course, is if you don't manage your weight correctly, then you lose all that advantage and you will you will not do well. Mm -hmm. And some of those practices are pretty um, are pretty drastic. And I just want to get into some of the detail of it. If you'll forgive me for uh, asking you mm -hmm. to talk about water doping in combat sports. So, you know, doping is quite close to my heart. So tell me <laughs> about water doping. Yeah, well, what? Water doping or, or water loading is a technique that I think started off in American wrestling, but it's where you take on a large amount of water over a period of time, usually a week or 10 days. And what this does is that you drink a lot of water very regularly. This fools your brain into stopping producing the hormone that makes you pass urine, antidiuretic hormone. Uh, and so you're you, you you're very dilute all the time. You're drinking all the time. And I see uh, MMA athletes come to see me, you know, dragging a, a ten litre canister of water with them because they're sipping it all the time. They're trying to get this hydration up, and you you and it fools the the body into uh, not producing the antidiuretic hormone, the hormone that. Uh, stops you from passing urine because the body is trying to get rid of all this extra fluid it's just trying to get rid of it all the time so it stops this hormone called antidiuretic hormone and that has to be made so that has to be made in your brain and it takes a certain amount of time to make it it takes about 48 hours to make it so if you are then you you sort of create you reach a balance whereby you're drinking whatever it is, 10 litres of water a day, and then you're peeing 10, 10 litres of water a day, and that's fine. And then you, if you stop then drinking before you have to weigh in, then you continue to pee because it takes quite a long time for your body to start to remake the antidiuretic hormone, the hormone that stops you passing urine. Mm. So your body then continues to pass 10 litres of water a day, uh, you do not replace it because you go on to a minimum amount of water and you lose a huge amount of weight uh, very quickly. And then when the antidiuretic hormone kicks in, you stop passing urine and you drink a lot and then your weight rebounds and goes up very, very quickly. So you then get back to what you were before you started uh, this procedure or even slightly heavier. And that sounds that sounds fantastic and very attractive for fighters because they can lose a huge amount of weight very quickly and then it then they can put it back on again before they have to fight. So that sounds like the ideal thing. Perfect. The problem is, of course, that manipulating uh, the body's fluids like that 
can cause huge problems. It can cause huge problems um, when you're passing a lot of urine, and it can cause a huge amount of problems when you stop passing urine. And this is all to do with the electrolytes in your blood. And at the worst end of that, you can end up um, uh, literally dying in the weighing room because uh, the electrolytes in the blood, the sodium and the potassium, uh, get to the wrong levels. This causes heart problems and heart arrhythmias, and you can collapse and die. That's the extreme end, and that doesn't happen very often, I'm pleased to say, but it does happen, and we've, we've seen that in, in uh, mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. But also, the, these changes that happen can also create problems with you when you want to perform. So you can actually underperform as well. Uh, particularly when the, you're getting the water back on again just before the fight, the water can go into slightly the wrong place. So it goes into the sort of the, the wrong uh, tissue areas mm -hmm. and you can end up underperforming. Mm -hmm. And I, the other thing, sorry, Michelle, <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to say about this is that, you know, this is, this is fluid manipulation. This is manipulating water. That's all you're doing. You're manipulating water. Mm -hmm. So if you were carrying too much fat before, and couldn't make the weight, then you'll still be carrying exactly the same amount of fat afterwards. You won't have touched the, the fat content. And if anything, you may have lost a little bit of protein be during the procedure. So you may not be in as good condition mm -hmm. after you've done this procedure than beforehand. So it's uh, it can be very dangerous. It doesn't necessarily help. And although it sounds very attractive, it's, it's certainly something that I would not, I would never recommend. And I think it's a very poor practice well you know, i'm glad you've given us that very detailed explanation because it's certainly something that uh we get a lot of questions about particularly um as its connection with the, the world of doping but from a practical point of view mike what rules or processes are already in place and what more should be done to reduce this serious risk to athletes' welfare from this extreme weight cutting? I think this is very difficult, Michelle, because the ideal thing would be to weigh the person as they stepped into the ring or the octagon. And then if they didn't make the weight, then they, they wouldn't fight. Of course, the problem with that is that if you're trying to put on a show, then it, you're at great risk of losing several fighters at that point, which is not a good thing. So they've tried putting the, the weight, um, the weighing in further away from the actual fight. And the problem with doing that is that it encourages you to go even more extreme on the, the water manipulation mm -hmm. because it gives you longer to recover before you fight. And the argument for that is, well, you know, the athletes shouldn't, you know, they should be okay by the time they get to the ring or the octagon but the trouble is uh it, it means that they can go more extreme on the on the the weight the, the the loss of fluid so i think you've got to try and get a balance and i know a lot of the the boards now are getting people to weigh in on a regular basis in the the six weeks before or even the two months before the the fight itself and to make sure that the weight that they're losing is is not extreme and uh, is reasonable and I think that's about the only way you can really do it if you've got a, a, a tournament where you're weighing in frequently over you know you've got four or five fights in a tournament on over several weeks then it's it's very difficult to lose a huge amount of weight through fluid manipulation because you just can't keep doing it you end up being at, you know you're maybe okay for one fight but then the second fight you're not so good and the third fight you're completely exhausted and, and that's a really important point to, to emphasize, particularly when we look at IMAF championships, which are over multiple days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is that risk benefit uh, approach. And, and uh, I can see that, uh, you know, from ex your experience, you've probably seen some dreadful things happening. I don't know if you've anything you particularly want to share. Uh, well, I, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the case of the, the boxer who uh, couldn't be roused before the, 
uh, this wasn't a British boxer, I hasten to add, um, but couldn't be roused before the weigh-in and they were very, very dry and had to be taken to hospital and rehydrated uh, intravenously and they, they never competed in what was a massive games at the time. Which uh, the lawyer in me says there's a there's certainly a case in there somewhere, um, and uh, um, I just hope that we're not seeing these sort of things being promoted uh, at the um, uh, you know to to the disbenefit of of our athletes. So, Mike, I'm going to uh, pause you there. So, I'm going to move to an, another medic on the the panel here and and, and ask Dr. Randa Bashron to join me on stage. Um, hello, Rhonda. You're there um, at the ringside, and uh, you see firsthand uh, MMA uh, competitions, and so you're going to see the impact of weight cutting. What really uh, are you seeing that you want to make sure people are absolutely aware should not be happening? I think you're on mute, so... Better. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much. I appreciate being on this panel. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, you know, I've had the advantage of being on all perspectives of MMA. I've seen it from the amateur side for single bouts or single competition up until multi multi day competitions such as at our Europeans or our world championships. Mm -hmm. And then certainly on the professional level where athletes are there for an isolated competition, plenty of time to prepare. And that's the only competition that they're dealing with that day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the most important thing I think for people to understand that, you know, in sport in general, we work so hard to get performance optimized. And a lot of that has to do with how well athletes are recovering. And then we get into the situation of combat sports or sports where there is weight cutting. And all of a sudden, all that optimization um, is now challenged because we're putting the athlete into a dehydrated state because of the weight cut. And it's a little bit of an oxymoronish uh, scenario. So you are now taking a recovered individual and depleting their sources. And as they approach their competition date, you know, we definitely see that there are all spectrums um, along the bell curve. I mean, just like Dr. Lusmore had mentioned, I mean, we see individuals where the weight cut was so significant that their um, vital signs are changed, their blood pressure is up, they have challenges with their um, heart rate, but physically, like, it's very clear that they just, I mean, they, they're, they're completely depleted and even have difficulty getting onto the scale. And at the risk of their competition being sacrificed because they're unable to do it, athletes collapsing. And then we you know we have variations in between. I think it's very commonplace for athletes to have this mentality, this mentality that we're like a vehicle. Like you can still drive a performance vehicle with you know half a cat, half a gas tank or low gas, and it'll still perform. Unfortunately, physiologically, as human beings, there's so many factors that go into it. So when we're depleted um, from a dehydrated state, our performance can be compromised. So we see you know limits in strength, power, especially because MMA is such a high intensity um, sport, um, these factors when we get dehydrated can influence it. A lot of people don't appreciate that dehydrated states can reduce blood volumes, um, decrease skin blood flow, sweat rate, heat dissipation, and the use of mul mul muscle glycogen use. And so most athletes don't really have an appreciation for the science behind that, but definitely they can appreciate that if they come to the table um, and they're dehydrated and their cognitive function is impaired, which is what we see in dehydration, that's gonna make a difference. MMA as a sport, you can't be off your game for a, not even a second, or that can be the risk of getting a knockout or getting a takedown that leads to a submission. So that cognitive deficit that happens in a dehydrated state um, and, and just not knowing that you're fully on your game clearly hits home with a lot of athletes, especially also if they know that it can be taxing on their physical performance. 
Um, interesting, what we see coming to the table after weigh-ins and pre-competition is that research tells us that most of these athletes are not fully rehydrated by the time they get into competition. And so although athletes may think, okay, they've prepared and they've done it, research tells us not only are they not using per, a, like guidance that is professional in their weight cutting process, they're also not getting rehydrated in time. And so we see the effects not only pre-bout, but during the bout, um, we can see the performance uh, changes. And then post-bout, the ability to recover, especially in a multi- um, multi-event situation um, is really imperative. I mean, perhaps, you know, an athlete can make it from one fight and win it, but then, you know, what's the longevity of their performance throughout the week? And certainly the bigger picture then becomes, like most of the experts today will agree, is what's the career longevity on these um, changes in um, the physiologic changes that happen after being dehydrated. So just in summary, we see hindering in motor skills, alertness, cognition. We also see that, um, that you know, the performance in this high intensity state is impaired. So I was going to ask you about dehydration, but I may just switch my question slightly to ask you more about rehydration. So should we be looking at rehydration levels with athletes as a way of if you like they're judging their eligibility to perform is that is that a way forward you know certainly as a physician there are multiple markers on the pre-physical um, exam that we're looking for the blood pressure the pulse um, you know what does the athlete look like in general like their physical appearance um, so we do have markers that help us understand how quote unquote, dry someone is, you know, but there is consideration. I mean, that is, you know, the complexity of it is, is, you know, looking at those factors before a fight and understanding has the athlete gotten rehydrated significant enough. I think just the awareness that most athletes are not, you know, up to 40% of them are not as rehydrated as they believe. And the, the more significant the cut as well as the closer the cut or the shorter the duration of the cut between competition, obviously the magnitude of the physiologic effects. So I think it's not only the awareness, but it's also professionally understanding how you're managing your weight cut, which I know um, Clint will be speaking, I, I believe, addressing some questions on that, but appropriately how to rehydrate and then realizing just the awareness that maybe people aren't as, as hydrated as they believe. So it's just, you know, success is by design. You know, do we want to help uh, address this issue? It's about being prepared and having that preparation just like every other aspect of the camp happen earlier versus later so that there's more time for the body to recover just like we focus on recovery as such an uh, uh, important entity on performance overall in all sports. So as a medic, what advice would you like athletes and particularly maybe their coaches to take on board regarding the sort of physical risks um, linked to weight cutting in the way that we see the culture um, around certain sports? I think in all sports, there's been a very intense focus on the um, brain, brain injury and just the consequences of brain trauma um, in any sport where there's high collision or contact, including MMA and boxing. So, you know, as we look at what happens in these dehydrated states, there is significant, there's, a, there's evidence that significant dehydration and dehydration can change brain morphology. Um, so the brain is very much a fluid-based uh, structure, and when you have this dehydrated state, you do deplete the, you know, the brain volume, if you will, and it increases the risk of brain injury arising from head trauma. And even if we look at the head trauma that results from just the, 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 the combat and the competition, there doesn't really need to even be the knockout or a TKO. There's still trauma that's occurring at the micro level, and that's well established in the literature. And so, you know, understanding from a career longevity, like what are the effects on the brain? What are the long-term effects on the body? You know, physiologically, there are hormonal changes. Um, and, you know, for as much as you deal with this on your world and anti-doping, I mean, people don't realize that as we get into these dehydrated states, there's hormonal changes and effects on things like testosterone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly too, as we talk about like, you know, what can we do to improve the management of this? I mean, the 
prevalence of women in MMA now is rising. And, you know, clearly this is a topic as well that's very relevant to women with all their hormonal um, changes. Uh, you know, being on oral contraceptives, there's a lot of reason um, physiologically why women will struggle with that, you know, that quick water weight uh, cut that's not going to be equally extrapolated to the male counterpart. And mm -hmm. so, you know, women carry more fat because of our ability to bear children and our physiologic uh, ability to have uh, and bear children makes it a, a challenge as women to do the weight cut. And there has to be even more strategy and more um, um, preparation um, as compared to the male counterpart. So, you know, these are all things to consider um, and not putting individuals at risk uh, when they're trying to succeed uh, and that's that's excellent i'm just also thinking about the the mental health issues that go on with this culture of weight cutting and and that can certainly affect both men and and women have you some thoughts on that Absolutely. I mean, like I said initially, I mean, you know, people tend to look at weight cutting like a vehicle driving on, you know, not a full gas tank. And physiologically, we're just not that way. And there's a multitude of parameters that go into what helps, you know, or augments performance or takes away from performance. I mean, everything from, you know, are you traveling, the kind of sleep quality you get, um, you know, what's your hotel room, other life stressors, and definitely life stressors, including the stress of having to make weight and the risk of losing it all if you get on that scale and you're not you're not at your weight can affect you know your mental capacity so now you take a dehydrated state where your cognitive performance is not on point the stress that also impedes your um, cognitive ability and the stress and all of those things are not a good formula for succeeding do athletes push through yes athletes by default are very mentally tough but if you could eliminate these factors and reduce stress as you enter into competition and just like in the video it's all about feeling your strongest and feeling good like, why wouldn't you do that? So it's just, you know, I guess my take home message is this is not just about dehydration. This is about looking at the entire um, aspect of performance enhancement and how do we get that to be optimized and, and reducing the amount of stress, not, not only mentally, but physiologically on the body by being more prepared in that weight cut process, um, I think will help the athlete not only you know, perform better, but also have repetitive long-term success over and over again. That, that's, uh, that's, that's a great thought there because uh, you can almost envisage the athlete having to prepare to compete with the scales before they even get into the competition and that in itself cannot be a, a good preparation for for competition thank you for that Rhonda. i'm going to come back uh, as i say to everybody but i'd like to uh, pass over now to to bring in uh, clint how are you doing clint yeah um I'm doing great so much for joining us um and uh you know from your experience not only as a nutritionist in the professional sport <laughs> environment but also you know as a former athlete yourself in the sport of wrestling um you know this this whole issue of you know weight categories and weight management is, is certainly something you've lived with for for many years can you give us a, an insight into your philosophy on this yeah, thank you, Michelle, and, and everybody else for your perspective thus far. Um, yeah, my background is is fairly unique, and clearly my experiences as a wrestler and in the nutrition and weight management challenges that I face personally, uh, as well as that I saw with my team and and um, and those that were around me, was uh, the driving force for for me professionally to get into the nutrition space. Um, I came through. Uh, I wrestled in college at the Division One level. Uh, and I started college the year after we had three uh, co collegiate wrestlers pass away in the weight cutting process. Um, and so the NCAA instituted a number of rule changes, um, some around hydration testing, some around slow and steady weight descent. And the most impactful by far was moving the competition to within an hour to two hours of weigh-ins. Um, mm -hmm. What that does is it limits your ability to 
you know, deplete yourself and recover and to be able to perform. And at the end of the day, it's all about what is your capacity for performance. So mm-hmm. that was something that I lived through. And personally, I struggled with weight management through college. I, um, I gained 50 pounds in college it, it being the same height. And so I, I just really um, ended up going up two weight divisions and um, kind of had to learn how to change my mindset around that and um, took mm-hmm. that all the way through uh, some of the Olympic um level wrestling that I did as well. And interestingly, the uh, the uh, IOC, UWW, um, the rate regulatory body for wrestling internationally has also moved lanes to two hours before competition um, as of the last Olympic cycle. Um, mm-hmm. There's many, many uh, similarities between wrestling and mixed martial arts in terms of weight cutting, um, both acutely and longitudinally. Um, and one of the things that has stood out to me as a different uh, kind of a differentiator between wrestling and mixed martial arts is that for wrestling, um, height and reach is not such an advantage in wrestling as it is in, in uh, a striking combat sport. And so I've found a lot of athletes are actually um, doing some of the more extreme weight cutting tactics, not necessarily to get an advantage competitively, but to reduce what they perceive as a height or reach disadvantage. And so that, you know, it just adds another layer to the um, kind of never have any quest to get an advantage or reduce a disadvantage uh, that these athletes are, are going through. And clearly at this level, at the uh, UFC level, but really we see just as uh, aggressive weight cutting tactics, even at the amateur level, um, that people just really put their heart and soul and uh, into um, competitive success. And they perceive that this fight is going to be impacted positively if they cut more weight and are bigger in the octagon. And with all due respect to the commentary that was provided before, um, I think that in a a one offset uh, situation, I think that being bigger in the octagon, even if an athlete undergoes more extreme depleting tactics, is going to provide that athlete an advantage in the octagon more times than not. Um, there are, we can all look to anecdotes where somebody may have been negatively impacted, but the, um, the determinants of success in this sport are so complex that mm-hmm. having a weight advantage can certainly be a, a differentiator. Um, I will say that um, the biggest um, motivator and something that I get a lot of athletes to reflect upon that may change their weight cutting um, habits and, um, and and the situation that they put themselves in is the long, longevity factor. Is can you do this? Can you um, use these behaviors uh, tactically in a way that allows you to make weight every few months um, in enough times to continue to get better as an athlete in order to win a UFC championship? And if the answer is no, then maybe we need to reevaluate our tactics, or we may, maybe need to reevaluate. Uh, your weight division selection, and that's not uh, that's not a a solution that I could tell athletes to to have. Um, really, I'm a resource for a bunch of independent contractors, um, and so this needs to be a conversation where I create some uh, opportunity for reflection, um, review some of the the historical uh, tactics and um, and results related to weight cutting, weight management, and performance. And, uh, and try to open a dialogue so that these athletes and, and their coaches and teams uh, can make a decision that supports their long-term performance, but also, uh, of course, embedded in that is that health and safety component. Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to ask you about the uh, how we debunk the mythology that goes on, um, because I think that's one of the the bigger problems we've got. If people think that's what you have to do, then the fact that they don't do it makes them think they're missing out in some way. But, you know, what role can nutrition itself um, and and science help in in terms of giving us the evidence to to debunk the mythology? Great, great question. And um, I think the the biggest theme with the, the team that we have here working with athletes is to, to shift from abusing nutrition in the weight cutting scenario. And, and when I say weight cutting, I, when, we, when we think of weight cutting, it's usually that acute weight cut over a fight week situation. But um, weight management and longitudinal weight descent is also equally important and can have equally catastrophic effects on the health, um, you know, hormonally and metabolically. Um, and so we need to think about using performance nutrition as a performance paradigm, it's foundational. It is what 
performance training, it's what the stimulus, it's what the adaptation is is built upon, is having nutritional foundation. Um, and so we want to you know, transition, we want to pivot from a, just abusing nutrition, which oftentimes happens, um, both fight week and, uh, and through the fight camp, where um, these, these calorie deficits that the athletes are undergoing is just really, really um, extreme and, and leads to catastrophic um, adaptation that the body is, is, is having to undergo just to preserve life and, and to preserve what it can. Um, and, and so what we want to do is to think about nutrition as something that is, is, is as important as any other area of preparation. Obviously, strength and conditioning, physical therapy, skill, and, and sport training are all critical to the performance in the octagon, but if you go, if you are just abusing the nutrition, then your body's ability to do this uh, this process multiple times is is going to collapse. And so that's kind of the big paradigm shift that I work with uh, you know, our team and, and our athletes here to really reinforce the fact that you can't train without nutrition. And our strength and conditioning team, in particular, they'll they'll kick athletes out of the weight room if they haven't eaten, if they haven't had the nutrition that 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 they know uh, needs to be there. And so they'll send them to us, and we, we have such an incredible closed loop system where then we're a resource to provide that food as well as education as part of the the, the process there. Uh, the last thing that that I'll say in terms of how to build science into this process is I think um, we, we get carried away in especially such a young sport, you know, clearly, you know, combative sports is not new, but MMA and UFC is fairly new. Um, and the research is, is starting to compile. Um, but in a, in a young sport like this, there ends up being kind of anecdote driven practice. And certainly you got to start somewhere. You got to start with something that you feel you has worked for somebody. Um, but what happens is that is not oftentimes very translatable. It's not scalable. It's not, um, adaptable to everybody. And a great example, uh, like Dr. Randa just highlighted is that, um, UFC and MMA started as a male sport, and a lot of these nutrition and weight cutting tactics that work for men didn't work for every male, right? There's always a bell curve, there's always a spectrum. But when you translate a lot of these tactics to your female athletes, um, many of them are, are getting horribly affected by some of the secondary effects to long-term low energy availability. We see an inordinate amount of hormonal dysfunction. Um, obviously, menstrual cycle is, is, a, is a red flag that is oftentimes identifiable, but um, that menstrual, dis, or sorry, the metabolic uh, dysregulation is something that we see over and over and over again. And oftentimes it's non-credentialed, non-licensed, non-formally educated or trained professional, you know, paraprofessionals in the space providing these blanket recommendations that have, uh, you know, they work for some uh, until they don't, and then they just move on. And then fortunately, we're here to help support athletes that, that um, some of those tactics don't work anymore. But um, I think for athletes and coaches really seeking out licensed professionals, and certainly the credentialing is going to be different wherever you are around the world. In the United States, we have um, sports dietitians, um, and I know other areas around the world have dietitians as well. In um, Europe, I think it's more of a physiology-based nutrition science, and that's fantastic. But wherever you are, um, seeking out those licensed credentialed um, professionals that not only have the training but also can just you know really decipher through some of you know, athlete struggles and, and provide the, the best practice uh, recommendations for each individual athlete, um, which is really a critical component to uh, weight class sport, sports nutrition. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it really is an important message about making sure that the, the advice that you're, you're getting is actually qualified advice from pe people who aren't, and certainly from my sort of anti-doping world, just aren't trying to flog you the latest, uh, uh, you know, sort of supplement that's going to be the the magic pill. Because as far as uh, I'm concerned, after decades involved in this, there is no magic pill, really. And, and I don't know if finally you've just got um, uh, a kind of insight you can give us uh, from, you know, what you recommend uh, for, for UFC athletes um, that the amateur athletes can learn from now? Is there, is there some standard of, of best practice in weight management that, that you could actually just give us some insight to? 
So, I mean, that, that's a really big question. Um, and, and I don't know that I have a specific answer to that, that really um, big question unless we have another couple hours. But what I would say <laughs> is that the preparation um, is really everything in terms of nutrition for combat sports. Um, mm -hmm. Athletes show up to fight week underprepared and that could be their body mass is too high. It could be the fact that they haven't had any heat exposure. It could be the fact that they are depleted and they haven't eaten in, you know, adequately in two weeks. All of these mm -hmm. um, are going to set um, this athlete up for, for a lack of success. And, and that could look like um, a missed weight. It could lo look like a poor performance or it could look like, um, you know, long-term metabolic impairment that's going to affect not just this weight cut, but the next one and the next one. And we, I always talk to athletes about this next fight camp, this next weight cut is a function of everything that has happened up until this moment. And, and athletes, um, really no athlete has ever missed weight until they do. And a lot of a lot of people uh, that we work with don't you don't have to worry about me. I've never missed weight, but n nobody ever missed weight until they did. And so mm -hmm. we we try, we try to work to understand what's happened in the past to to prepare for this next one. Um, but it's not just the fight week preparation. It's really preparing the body to be within striking distance when they sign that that fight contract, so that that weight descent can be um, can be moderate, can be fueled, can be um, you know can support a fight camp where there's skill acquisition rather than a fat camp where the entire focus is, is weight management, um, which really undermines any of that long-term athlete development, which Paula really talked about at the onset of the, the limitation of athlete development when weight and nutrition is a limiting factor. So um, especially these young athletes and, and related to the amateurs and some of the, the younger professional athletes, I know a lot of a lot of sport culture and I've heard even managers have pushed the younger athletes to cut weight while they still can, right? The body is more resilient because they're younger. I, I have the exact opposite philosophy. When you're young, you need to accumulate ring time. You need to accumulate cage time. You need to be able to get better between fights. And I really, really strongly encourage those young athletes uh, to focus on skill acquisition, uh, focus on the ability to train and recover. And, and these young athletes, the sport of MMA is so complex. They're in the gym for five, six, seven hours at times because mm -hmm. of some of the skills that are, are demanded. You got to be nourished in order to accomplish this and to get better as a result. And that includes both on the MMA side as well as on the metabolic side, which drives that long-term uh, kind of body composition and recovery status. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's really really interesting, and thank you, thank you for that. I'm going to give you a, a, a rest and the whole panel a little bit of a rest at the moment, um, and I'd like to call up on stage um, uh, Kerith Brown um, in order to uh, give us a, a more personal insight. Um, uh, some of you um, will um, know Kerith, but if I just briefly uh, make the introductions, well, uh, Kerith. Um, Thank you, and I know this is a, a say a little bit of a, a a chance I'm taking with my life, uh, talking to you as my president, as well. But you were an elite judo athlete in the 1970s, the 1980s, and uh, we want to hear from you about you really, you know, what athletes' views were of making weight at, at that point in time. Before I get to your own personal story. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, and uh, thank uh, the rest of the panel for uh, a great insight in terms of their presentation and their experiences. Uh, for me, um, you know, just listening to that and just going back to uh, uh, my own experience in terms of uh, weight cutting, uh, I wish you guys were around back in the uh, late 70s and 80s. You know, uh, mm -hmm. weight cutting was uh, something of an experience. You know, we never had the luxury of sports science involved and in, the new technology and i have to say that uh, just listening to the development of sports science and where we are today in terms of sports directors and in terms of uh, performance directors and nutritionists and so forth it has come on in leaps and bounds so if you go back to the late 70s and 80s it was trial and error you know i mean in terms of how we uh underwent in terms of uh, cutting uh weight you know it's just between ourselves and the coach mm -hmm. and uh, having experience was something that, uh, you know, we were, I suppose, making it up as, as we went along. We, we had no guidelines in terms of uh, being able to have a set format and to kind of have something was a benchmark. So it was trial and error in terms of my own 
and you know being able to compete at that level in terms of European Worlds and Olympics um, in those early years, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to as being able to have an, a sort of uh, an insight and being able to uh, have that ability to uh, you know feed into conversations and development as we move you know, as a, as we come into the 21st century. Yeah. Well, what we what we know, Kerith, is that you know, people are making some very taking some very drastic action to to kind of make weight and and getting themselves into all sorts of of, of difficulty. And uh, uh, you know, from our previous discussions, I've known that you've said it, it hadn't really been a, a big issue for you because uh, you you'd actually you know sort of not necessarily got those extremes of, of, of weight to, to have to deal with. You were a bronze medalist at the 84 Olympics and then preparing for the uh, 88 Olympics in Seoul, um, uh, you know, you had an injury in the run up to those games. Um, can you describe what happened uh, and, and uh, to you, you know, in the lead up and then obviously during the Seoul games, um, please? Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, in terms of uh, my own uh, experience leading up to 88, I had uh, a knee injury and uh, had to have an operation six months before uh, the Olympic Games. And um, <clears throat> subsequently, um, as when I returned to play, I wasn't able to uh, put any pressure onto the knee. So subsequently being selected, you know, they took a chance on me going um, to the 1988 uh, Games. Subject mm. to my performance that I had in 84 mm -hmm. and uh, in traveling over there then I took a substance which was at that uh, point in time a banned substance and subsequently mm -hmm. lost my bronze medal in, in uh, 88 and uh, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that probably a mistake naivety not having the support and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, information was really a lack of education back in the late mm -hmm. 70s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and that's a really unfortunate situation to, to get in because obviously certainly a lot of the things that I see going on, um, we, we've had them with uh, with our own testing program with IMAF, uh, where we can identify somebody who's, who's clearly tried to cut weight by the use of substances, but it is so easy to, to um, fall foul of the anti-doping rules simply because you're trying to treat the swelling associated with an injury and and uh, I think your experience really shows how important it is so what do you believe the key issues are now for athletes and for athlete support personnel in terms of managing their weight in, in MMA I, I think the most important factor and I've listened to a lot of what the panel have said mm. and a lot of information coming in to the athlete in terms of where we are in a modern world if you look at where we were in the late 70s and 80s you know, it was totally different you know it was lack of education and lack of support lack of funding and you mm -hmm. can go the list just goes on in terms mm -hmm. of actually my sport of judo you, know, you could cut back in them kind of like a minority sport but you know platform and being involved in the olympics and i, I think the most important fact for me is the relationship between the athlete and the coach the coach is the most important part of an athlete performing at the highest level. You know, right. the personal yeah. coach has to be the mentor, the doctor to a certain extent, everything that you, we talk about, you know, going back from my own experience. And I still see this moving into, you know, the next generation in terms of, I don't think we give enough emphasis to the coach and what he has to do or she has to do in order to prepare the athlete, especially extreme weight cutting, you know what I mean? And when you get extreme weight cutting, yeah, extreme weight cutting, the athlete has, you know, could have mental issues, could have in the sense of, you know, short tempered and everything that comes with weight cutting is, is really uh, difficult for the athlete, which is put on a to perform at the highest level mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. overlook that support package. And I think also the family, the support mechanism around the athlete that the families in terms of how they support um you know their you know their partner in being able to go through this journey i think you know sometimes i think we overlook that and as i keep going back the coach is 
you know, vitally important in terms of being able to assist, uh, especially when you're detached from, you know, in my uh, experience from Team GB or from the national, the international, from the national federation, in order to have that, um, you know, kind of performance related experience. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, uh, you know, regrettably, you've had a very, very hard lesson um, yourself. And, and uh, I think what's, you know, certainly um, I, I think is inspirational from my perspective is your your absolute dedication to, to actually make sure that we learn a lot from all those lessons. And really th that your work with IMAF in trying to make, you know, sort of the... The, the holistic approach to to sort of to safe clean fair MMA is is some something that you know is really being so so helpful so is there an opportunity here do you think to try and get the responsibility to be jointly shared by way of ent entry if you like of the athlete to an event should it be something that the coach signs off on and the doctor signs off on what do you think um, I, you know, for me personally, you know, it's a personal uh, journey to ensure that we, we that support. And I think, you know, mm. I have something put in place where the coaches do sign um, because I think they're accountable as well to a certain extent. You know what I mean? They've been, you know, mm. through that journey with that athlete on a personal journey. And I, I think to uh, safeguard that because the athletes are extreme, you know, under extreme pressure to perform at the level. So I think from my own personal experience you know mm -hmm. I, you know kind of uh, taking that journey and, and ensuring that the next generation of athletes uh, are well equipped with the information and well supported by the support mechanisms around them because there's still a lot of information out there and a, there's a lot of moving in terms of sports science and, and i think it's a lot and you know if you're not well funded it makes it even harder for mm -hmm. them to engage and you, you, you've only got the, some of the athletes that uh, are performing in mixed martial arts and through you know professional contracts and you look at the journey that uh, they have to take and then we've got to safeguard you know the next generation of amateur athletes and mm -hmm. it's out there and if uh, you know you think of the funding that the professional athletes will gain you've just got to look there's less funding for the amateur athletes so how are we going to you know ensure that the message is received and is drilled down structurally, I think is an important factor. And I think we, and especially from my own experience, you know, I'm in endeavoring to try and safeguard that because of my own experiences, which I take personally. So for one athlete that we can save in terms of weight cutting and making sure that, uh, you know, the anti-doping program is set in stone, that's what I'm going to do in terms of making sure that we have the best experts to give them the support that they need uh, throughout their development and throughout their career. Well, Kerith, I'd like to think you've got the best anti-doping advisor on board. So uh, um, th thank you, uh, thank you for for sharing that. And I know uh, it, it's personally still very tough for you to think on on those terms. But uh, I'm just going to invite everybody who's listening in to put any questions in the question box while I just uh, look to call up the rest of the panel um, on to stage and stay with us, Kerith, because that would be. Uh, um, really helpful to to get that uh, athlete experience as well. Not that obviously our uh, panel aren't um, uh, athletic in their own um, minds as well. I, I'm not sure. I had a message that we lost Paula. Is that true? Um, I'm hoping that she's managed. To, lovely, you managed to reconnect. Lovely. So, um, and I'm going to invite you all to. Um, to unmute yourselves so that you can actually join the conversation, but I will direct uh, questions uh, accordingly. And and you've you've heard um, from each other, and you've also heard from from Kerith. And um, you know when we talk about uh, athlete welfare, um, if I bring in uh, uh, Paula and and uh, and, and uh, Clint on this one, so I go uh, opposite ends of uh, you know sort of. Um, you know who's really responsible for athlete welfare paula can you tell us first what you think about athlete welfare who's really responsible oh well i mean i think it depends on on the age of the athlete as well um i think for a, for a junior athlete without a doubt the parents are responsible the coach is responsible <clears throat> the federation's responsible there are team managers 
that should also be responsible. The national governing body and the international governing bodies are hugely responsible. Um, and then I think as the athlete gets older, some of that responsibility passes from the parents to themselves. Mm -hmm. It stays with the coach, it stays with the federation, stays with the governing bodies. But, you know, that it, it just makes me think of all the stories we've heard from gymnastics where parents seem to have been shut out of uh, the, the the training room and, and uh, therefore they haven't been uh, able to uh, sort of uh, even sort of perhaps understand some of the the, the the scrutiny that their children may have been going through. So that's quite worrying. Um, and, and Clint, how do you uh, uh, deal with athlete welfare from from a UFC perspective? You know, what's the uh, what what's the insight you can give us on that? That's a really complicated scenario, actually, here mm. at the UFC. Um, the UFC Performance Institute is part of the UFC uh, as a company, but we're a little bit um, kind of distinct in terms of us being athlete centered for care and performance development. Um, so there is a, a degree of, of um, confidentiality when athletes uh, connect with us that we certainly take on some burden of responsibility when we support these athletes. Um, in terms of as the sport in general uh, at the UFC level, it's, it's a really um, a diffuse uh, kind of management of athlete responsibility uh, in, in health and wellness. Um, the commission takes on, uh, you know, establishing the, the rules and regulations. Uh, the, you know, the, the commission doctors and um, I know the Association of Ringside Physicians uh, have uh, some burden of care uh, related to the athlete health and safety. And then the promoter, uh, ourselves here at the Performance Institute, and then connecting with our medical team, um, you know, work to support the athletes as, as well as we can um, to it, first and foremost ensure health and safety. And, and there's cases, and just this past week, um, had to have hard conversations with athletes um, during their weight uh, cut process that their, their health and well-being is the first and foremost responsibility of us. Um, and we want to support them to be able to go compete and to, to demonstrate um, their skills and, and, and their, um, you know, their mixed martial arts proficiency, but first and foremost, uh, safe um, and effective in, in, in the weight making process. So it's really kind of a, a, a decentralized approach. Um, yep. it's very contrasting to uh, the NCAA uh, for, for the college uh, competitions here in the United States, which is kind of centralized and, and um, dictates all of the rules and regulations. Um, so this is this is a little bit harder to wrap our um, you know our heads around in terms of uh, implementing holistic change, but certainly that is um, something that drives me professionally and is, is kind of the burning spirit behind uh, behind everything that we're doing here on the nutrition side. Brilliant. Thank thank you for that. And we've got just the right person there. Now turning to our doctors. Um, certainly, what I am interested in is: uh, Have you got any thoughts on the? Um, uh, on you know from a medic's perspective on the kind of percentage of weight loss uh, that you'd see is really um i think you know going in into the the territory of this is dangerous would you would you say there's a figure you can put in it ronda first what's your thoughts um yeah it's interesting because when you know i think we've all you know paula is an athlete you know most of us have some athletic you know background to a degree and i think we can all appreciate the athlete mentality um you know especially thinking about ufc clint you know i'm reminded that a lot of these athletes are are, are very opportunistic right they get an opportunity to fight they want to take it and sometimes they'll come off one fight and then you know, they're offered another fight, you know, they won, you know, contractually, you know, it's about getting the payday. So, and escalating their careers, right? More fights, more opportunities for championships. And so, you know, what hits home for, for athletes is, you know, you know, can I get the win? And so sometimes at the extent of what may potentially be, um, you know, compromising to health. You know, there was an interesting study that was done out of the Journal of Strength and Conditioning back in 2018, where they did look at MMA fighters and what, you know, kind of try to hone in on what percentage. And they looked three hours after a weight cut and 24 hours after a weight cut and did a sled push. I think it was like a a, um, a, a medicine ball and um, I think a vertical height. You know, and what they did realize is that uh, 
at a 4.8 uh, reduction in body mass resulted in physical performance changes. Um, you know, and you know, we see cognizant deficits with as little as 2%. So, you know, I mean, I, I think to Clint's um, point, you know, the advantage is with weight, you know, in MMA. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where's that, where's that magic line where you can preserve that weight advantage without being at the disadvantage? Um, so that's a great question about percentage. I think, you know, you know, getting as close to uh, b the recovery of from a dehydrated state back to your ideal weight is like the most important. So it's not about as how much have you redu redu reduced as well as how much have you recovered that reduction and that balance. I know I'm kind of circumventing the answer to that question, but you know, staying at the lowest percentage as possible. And then also remembering that most people don't appreciate how much they're still dehydrated when they're actually stepping back into the ring um, and making sure that that is accomplished in the time span from the weight cut to competition. Okay, well, we, we've got some more questions coming in, but I'd be interested in uh, hearing Mike's uh, thoughts on, you know, is there a magic percentage that we can try and guard, guard against? Well, I'm glad you asked Randa first, because that's uh, I think she did a really good job in answering that. I'm glad you didn't ask me for it on that one. Um, she's quite right. I mean, I think, you know, certainly 5% dehydration you're getting uh, would be a, a cutoff that we would we would use. I think it's in the professional field, it's you have much more advantages because you have a lot more support staff, you have a lot more advice. I think if you're looking at a, an amateur sport, uh, you know, worldwide, where perhaps you don't have those uh, that help. And I think, um, you know, we would think that 2% weight cut uh, before a fight was uh, the limit. And that uh, if you were beyond 5%, then that would could cause you serious problems. Um, I think there is a, a danger with the actual cut as well as the actual rehydration. So um, uh, I, I kind of disagree with Randa that <clears throat> the importance is in the rehydration. I think the importance is uh, you, you, that you don't try and cut too much. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Izzy if uh, we've got questions from the uh, audience that we uh, we could bring up if. Uh, You've got any specific question, Izzy? Um, got I can see one or two. Um, yes. So I mean, you've just addressed. There's been a couple about um, fat percentage and um, and percentage of weights be cut for fights. Um, but there's an interesting um, one about what has a bigger influence on um, on extreme weight cutting practices. Is it the rules around the weigh-in or or competition in other sports, or is it the culture? Well, that is an interesting one. So uh, um, <laughs> I'm I'm wondering uh, if I can turn to um, Rhonda on that about the the <clears throat> the rules or the culture. So, um, so I just want to make sure I understand the question. What's more influential, the culture or the rules? Um, um, yeah, I'm just paraphrasing that. I'm trying to get the question. Yeah. I mean, certainly the rules um, are the rules, right? Those, so that's the ultimate determinant of can you compete? So if you step on that scale and you're above weight, well, that rule is going to make that determination. I think there's a strong, strong influence of culture. I think, um, you know, anybody on this panel, you know, including Clint, because he's, you know, entrenched in it. The culture is a very big driving force. There's a lot of empirical things that people do to cut weight. If you look at um, research that's been done, a lot of athletes um, across the board in terms of in, for MMA, from amateur to professional, I mean, they're using things like what they see on social media and what other people have done as part of their weight cutting practices. And I think, you know, if anybody listening today can collectively take home what the message is, is, you know, professionally and um, uh, managing weight from <clears throat> an organized and a structured standpoint is 
certainly very critical. So the culture plays into the methodology of cut weighting, weight cutting, um, you know, relative importance, you know, is the mass going into the ring more important than the consequences of the weight cutting? Just like Dr. Lewis Moore said, you know, how do you rehydrate and what's the best practices of rehydrating? You know, and certainly Clint is, you know, the expert in the area can speak on appropriate rehydration methodologies and what to do to be successfully back um, point for performance. So I think, you know, the rules determine the ultimate, uh, you know, uh, uh, dividing line of whether you get in the ring or not. But the culture, I think, is a strong force, you know, leading up to that point. Okay, um, it might be a, a, a good moment for me to mention a, a very uh, recent document that's come out from the uh, American College of Sports Medicine and the expert consensus statement on weight loss in weight category sports. Um, I'm sure we can uh, make sure there's a link to that uh, coming out uh, to uh, everybody um, listening in on that. But it, it's it's interesting that a lot of what we're reflecting is, is certainly being echoed there. So. Mike, when you're looking at uh, rules, and, and I'm going to bring in Paula as, as well in a moment, but Mike, first, um, in terms of, you know, the way in rules, uh, the, you know, sort of, do they, do they dictate the culture or do, is it the other way around, do you think? I mean, I know the governing bodies put the rules on way in together. Yeah, I, I think the, the rules around the way in uh, become permissive. So mm. if you have a way in, um, 36 hours before the, the fight then that gives you a, a, a greater time to rehydrate therefore you can your weight cut can be fiercer um, so you uh, you know that does dictate when you have the way in mm. really does dictate mm. and if you had as I said before if you had the way in just before you stepped into the ring or the octagon then you would have to be on weight you couldn't mm. uh, the the, the the idea of dehydrating um, and then stepping into the, the ring would be would be madness because, as Rhonda said, you know, two percent weight loss, you start getting cognitive uh, problems, and if you can't think when you're inside the ring, then you're in real trouble. So I think you have to have a, a compromise, and I think the best compromise is multiple weights throughout the build-up to a to a fight. Well, you know, and that's why I wanted to just sort of compare with with Paula's experience in athletics. I mean, um, would would weigh ins, if you like, um, trying to find a healthy body weight help in athletics and 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 help with that that sort of you know rapid weight loss for you know in terms of of trying to get to that magic sort of power weight ratio? Uh, have you any thoughts on that? Um. I don't really feel it would be too relevant um, within athletics. I think um, we have to do the training. I mean, if I'm thinking even for the marathon, you need to get yourself at kind of race weight, if you like, and hold it for five or six weeks or so. Um, but you, you, you wouldn't be able to change it in the week of the race. You need to be training at that consistently. So I think it, it's less of an issue there. And I think it's really more an athlete and a coach and the support system working together to find their the athlete's individual best um, body fat percentage with calipers and with testing um, mm -hmm. that correlates with the best performance. Or you can do it simply, as I, I guess I did growing up, just trial and error, at which weight do I produce my best performances just by weighing yourself at your weight and then working out how you, you work around that. But it really is a, a lot of things coming together. It's not just weight. It's your strength, it's your workouts and what you're able to do there and the volume of training that you've done. Whereas I think the, the issues we've been talking about, it makes sense to me to, to look at regular weigh-ins over a period so there isn't that one event that you're aiming for where you can then rehydrate again afterwards. Um, you want to be at a sensible, healthy level for a period of time coming into that so that you're fighting at the same healthy level that you've been at in training which would be the strategy that you'd adopt for for a marathon yeah yeah so. absolutely i mean you'd actually gain weight coming into a marathon because you want to be picking up and fueling up on, on glycogen so you mm -hmm. want to be carbo loading in that week mm -hmm. so you actually would be kind of what we call race weight a mm -hmm. week before 
um, mm. and then would be above that on the starting line, well above that, um, and then aim to not have lost too much by the finish. Okay, lovely. We've got some really interesting questions coming in, and what we're hoping to do is if we don't ask them live, we will try and get back to you with an answer. Um, and uh, Izzy, have you got another question for us? Oh, yeah, there's been a couple about younger athletes. So um, should younger athletes specifically be prevented from engaging in weight practices used by senior athletes? Are there policies we should introduce? And is there a different approach that's needed? So younger athletes <laughs> and uh, is a different policy needed? Should um, what was the middle bit? <laughs> Um, sh should they be prevented from engaging in weight cutting practices used by senior athletes? Prevented. Okay. Sh should they be stopped, or should it just be a different approach? That's going to be that's going to be an interesting one. Emerging um, questions. There's a few about youth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, that, that might be something I can get the whole panel to get a, 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 a you know. Do we need a, a strategy specifically for younger athletes um, and uh, should they be prevented from from entering into weight cutting practices? I haven't quite gotten into how we're going to do this, but, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, Mike, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm pleased this question has been asked. I think this is really, really important, particularly in growing athletes. I'm not necessarily... These might not be, you know, children. This is, might be adolescents or even, you know, 17, 18 year olds who are still growing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very difficult when you're working in a weight controlled sport and you have a very successful athlete at a certain weight and that athlete is still growing. And um, I'd really be interested. To, this is this is a conundrum that's extremely difficult to crack. And I'd be really interested to put Clint on the spot here and find out whether he's got any thoughts on what we do with the, you know, the growing athlete uh, who is, um, you know, who we're, we're kind of keeping small by restricting their weight because by restricting their weight, we're restricting their growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, is a baton being passed around the panel? Clint, have you got some thoughts on that before I come to Rhonda next? <laughs> I do. And to your to your original question, I think absolutely there needs to be regulations in place for junior athletes. Um, I think youth, um, clearly you want to eliminate any sort of nutrition manipulation, weight manipulation in particular, um, that's going to cause, uh, well, really drive athletes to seek a competitive advantage through nutrition and weight making practices. I think as you get to more of like the junior highly competitive athletes, it needs to be a, a, a bit of a um, rules to disincentivize weight cutting, but certainly there's going to be nutrition used for you know, weight for weight making. Um, and it, it, as the athletes are growing out of weight classes, and this is where um, I oftentimes see in in the sport of wrestling in particular, um, I think the culture around weight cutting has improved dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years. The times that we see the worst weight cutting weight cutting practices or when, as indicated, an athlete hits a growth spurt in the middle of the season, or when they can't make the starting lineup and they have to do crazy stuff to fit into the lineup. And so um, that's where I, I think there needs to be some real limitations on, on how, in particular, the athlete that's trying to lose weight to fit a, fit into the lineup um, can go about that. But for the athlete that is is growing mid-season, it's really hard to, to have policy to, to affect that. And I think that that becomes a culture change. It becomes something that, um, you know, coaches and support staff um, need to try to identify, but it, it, it's hard when there's a lineup and athletes have, you know, get, get jumbled around and whatnot. Um, and one, one quick athlete that, that I can reference is in that um, Kyle Dake, who wrestled at Cornell where I coached, he hit a growth spurt in the middle of his freshman year, 18 years old and had to had to cut ex pretty dra dramatic amounts of weight and ended up being successful in that um, but it's it's such a it's such a slippery slope and there's no real way to i think policy your way out of that well let me just jump to to Kerith, uh, from a, a sort of a federation perspective i wonder if the federation rules uh, of a sport ought to be more flexible um, in terms of the weight categories, maybe more weight categories for uh, younger athletes. Some thoughts on that? 
yeah um you know just listening uh, i i agree it shouldn't be encouraged at all and uh mm -hmm. you know something that we're looking at is we uh, have more weight categories but the, the problem with that is that you're just pushing it to the next division or the next mm -hmm. category so okay. i think it needs to be more structured i think uh, you know having policies put in place and again i think uh, the coach the coaches will know of their individual athletes and what they're you know kind of pushing them to do i think mm -hmm. that's key is the support mechanism around mechanism mm -hmm. around the coaches and the national federations in terms of uh, yeah. pushing it to win at all cost so okay. i think it's important for us to again drill down into the support mechanisms and see how we can give assistance to not encourage something that's been you know handed down generations and generations before it's a culture change yeah. it and admittedly yeah. is changing over a period of time now as i said you know if you're looking from the 70s and 80s it's a massive change to where we are today right right okay okay Izzy, further questions um yes but there's a couple asking whether mma promoters should um carry out mandatory hydration tests on fighters at events well, I, I wonder if uh, Rhonda's got any thoughts on, on that because you'll have seen some of the, the of uh, the well the hydration practices going on. Particularly, the Nevada State Athletic Commission may have some thoughts too. Um, you know, I think some of the things that have been set in place, um, you know, is number one, you know, having a regulatory body. I think there's, you know, certainly. At, at different points, if you look across the board in the sport, there's going to be conflict of interest between the promoter's agenda and, and, and having that regulation in place protects the athlete. I think the more regulations that we have and the rules, um, de-incentivizing aggressive weight cuts by creating weigh-in and competition time closer together, there's different strategies to help with that. I think, yes, you know, definitely there are competitions that are very well resourced. And then there's others that are not. And then there's athletes that don't have the resources. I think, you know, there needs to be some accountability to allow for um, some nutritional and rehydration uh, resources available for athletes during competition um, and lessen the load of relying on the athletes to go and obtain them themselves uh, to do kind of like a collective part in ensuring that the athlete is prepared for competition. Um, from way in to that time. So, you know, you know, I just think about at the international level, multiple day competitions, it's really hard for athletes while they're trying to get ready and um, <clears throat> cut weights and X, Y, and Z to go out and be like, you know, you know, do I have enough water? Do I have enough uh, re uh, resources to get my electrolytes and rehydration back? So I think that's a great place where we can unify as a in, as a group collectively to ensure that the safety and the health and well-being of athletes is appropriate in maintaining the regulations so that we limit some of the um the the, the risk and the temptation to be aggressive about the weight cutting because people feel like they can get away with it you know i've, I've been wondering myself about the the whole approach to sort of hydration tests uh, even as part of uh, improving my anti-doping uh, intelligence on on athletes and uh, um, that may be something I come back and, and talk to you more about uh, all of you because uh, I, I'd like to try and take away the huge cost of the actual anti-doping test and look at how people are preparing to be you know sort of compete at their best without us having to try and prove it later so we're actually monitoring in a different way um izzy one more question is there um yeah we have a lot of questions so i think we'll be needing to follow up with everybody okay. but, um, i've got a good one here what are we able to action today to make this happen we have the leaders of this industry and external consultants around the table here now Wow. Okay. What are we able to do today? Okay. I'm just rubbing my hands here. The thoughts of all this. Um, uh, Mike, would you like to kick us off? What can we do today? I think the fact that this is happening today is a major step forward. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, I think you were talking before about where does the where does this come from? And I think with all organisations, the attitudes always come from the top. And if the top of organizations are prepared to overlook 
um, severe weight cutting and overlook athletes, you know, being unwell when they come to weigh in, then that doesn't reflect well. And I think the fact we are having this discussion today uh, shows that that we are taking it seriously, and that I think the the the, the positive attitude comes from the top. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, Kareth is at the top. So, <laughs> should we put him on the spot here? What can we do today? I agreed, he comes from the top, and uh, as the international federation saw duty to make those recommendations, uh, you know, we, we've had athletes that have come into our events, and and, and we have stopped athletes that we've uh, uh, had information that has had extreme weight cutting in our events, and we've actually pulled them out of the event. So it starts mm -hmm. at the top, and and you know we have to make those recommendations and make everybody accountable mm -hmm. uh, along that pathway. I think it's important. You know, especially with the sport of the mixed martial arts and especially for amateur development, that we send the right message and a positive message in terms mm -hmm. of, um, you know, the development of these athletes. Mm -hmm. OK, lovely. Can I bring up Paula and say, Paula, what would you like to see happen now? I mean, I know we haven't quite persuaded you to join us in MMA. Um, <laughs> uh but uh, there's still time um but uh obviously you know what would you like to see from from your perspective i think it's it's a safeguarding of the athletes particularly the young athletes um and making sure that their health and their future is looked after i think that has to be done on an education front um from the young athletes to the parents to the coaches and all of the surrounding team that we've talked about um, similar in a way, I guess, to the, the anti-doping fights. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have to keep that perspective that it is just sport and mm -hmm. that there is a health and a life afterwards that needs to be safeguarded. Um, and I guess you have the other argument on the anti-doping point that it is cheating. With This, this isn't mm -hmm. cheating, but it is still damaging your long-term health. And I think yeah. it's getting that education point across to the athletes that there is a, a healthier way, a smarter way, that will safeguard their their life afterwards and their life after sport and still allow them to perform yeah and and it is that culture where you if you're pushing at the rules uh, how easy it is then to just fall over and and actually start to use a doping substance deliberately mm -hmm. for for that kind of weight management um clint if i bring you up and uh, say uh, ask you what what can we do today i have a lot of thoughts on this um first and foremost i think this platform, this dialogue and discussion, both with this world-class set of panelists as well as the, the great questions from the audience, is a really good step. I think addressing both the culture uh, as well as some of the policy is, is really critical to address it from both ends. And, and clearly, um, I'm committed and we're committed here to supporting both. Um, on the education front, we uh, are releasing the second version of our UFCPI journal. Um, this time it's like 10 times bigger and more expansive and there's many, many parts on nutrition, weight management, weight making, um, and it's free of charge to the MMA and public community to, to download. Um, UFCPI online, I believe, is, is where you go to get that and it'll be released next week. Um, so this week we're making our way through UFC 261 and then next week we're gonna release it. Um, and it's gonna be a, an amazing resource um, uh, for, for the community, um, both MMA and outside of MMA. Um, secondly, we're going to, on the back end of that, have a, a certification process for uh, those providers in this space. So hopefully try to influence the education and the culture change component, which, as we know, is just so complex and, and slow moving, but we're really committed to that here. Um, and then the, the, the third thing is, is really trying to continue this conversation. And something that I'm really committed to is to continuing to um, together a task force of sorts of, of those that um, our stakeholders in this uh, in, in this conversation um, that includes, of course, athletes and coaches, but also uh, medical providers, regulatory bodies, promoters, um, and, and just to continue this process of, of um, working through what what is working, what isn't working, um, and and to to try to find a way to support athletes' health and longevity, as well as the performance and, and, and really the, the true essence of the sport because cage fighting is hard enough without having to 
go and uh, put yourself uh, you know, on death's door, uh, which is what we see at times. And, and so we really want to make sure that the, the essence of the sport um, and, and the, the sportsmanship of it uh, comes through uh, without the, um, you know, the, the need to, to put yourself in medical jeopardy. So um, I'm just really excited to be part of this panel. Appreciate you guys for hosting it and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for that, Clint. Now, Rhonda, last word to you. What's the what's the what's our big takeaway from this in terms of what we're going to get on and do? Um, you know, I you know, I think I really um, have to commend, um, you know, institutions like UFC and the work that Clint's done. You know, we have strong leaders in IMAF. You know, one of our biggest agendas with IMAF is being thought leaders and being in a representation for the sport, especially for our amateur athletes, uh, to protect them and to secure their longevity and promote the success of their careers. And I think the biggest takeaway is that we need to come together and speak on a unified platform um, in terms of delivering the same message with health and safety uh, for the athlete being first and making sure all of our agendas are on the same page with that. And I think what will unfold from that um, without drilling down on all the details is that every entity will start to do their part. UFC Performance Institute led by a great example, you know, put out educations that's accessible to all. Um, IMAF by making sure that athletes are stepping up to competition and before the competition starts that their weight is on point and already at an ideal position so that they're not having to deal with day-to-day -day weight cuts that are too extreme. Um, all of us can do a collective part as medical providers, making sure that we're not overlooking the athlete that may be at risk if they're coming to the table in their pre-physicals, uh, pre-fight physicals um, in a position that might put them at detriment. I mean, we all have a portion to contribute to the accountability of making sure that our athletes are healthy and safe. And, you know, to, our, to Kara's point, you know, the coach, it's not just the coaches, it's the support system of the athlete that also have an accountability measure to make sure that we are um, looking towards the athlete's best interest because there's going to be a bias. The athlete's going to be uh, slated to win. And sometimes that drive to win can um, create, uh, you know, behaviors or mechanisms that may not be in their best interest, especially long term. Michelle, I think you're muted. Sorry, I got the, the note to unmute my microphone and I couldn't actually uh, click on it. I was afraid I was going to cut you all off. Um, uh, so thank you, Rhonda, that you've really summarized, uh, you know, the, the whole thing from my perspective. And uh, I know that there's been a lot of really excellent questions coming through as well. So um, I'm afraid uh, from the panel's perspective, there may be a little bit more work to do after this uh, event so that we can get back. And uh, I'm right in thinking, Izzy, we're going to share all the questions and the answers uh, maybe anonymously um, uh, with people so they get, can see an answer to uh, to the question. Um, uh, yeah. I know there are several questions there. Um, Clint, it looks like you've got a bit of a fan club coming your way. So thank you for the advertisement on the UFC uh, um, publication. That will be something we'll certainly look out for. Um, uh, is there anything else, Izzy, that you want me to cover um, from a question perspective? Um We've got so many questions, so I think um, there are a couple, actually, if we could get one for um, athletics. Um, we have, I specialise in the high jump discipline relating directly to my event or athletics as a whole. What is the most significant tip or process to follow when cutting weight for competition in the springtime leading into the summer season? Okay, um, Paula, it's from athletics, it's high jump. I wonder if you'd like to share a thought about, because that's obviously got a more seasonal approach to it than uh, than we see in MMA for competitions or for uh, specific date uh, events. What do you think? Well, I mean, I have to say from the beginning, I don't have any knowledge in that area at all. It wasn't a discipline that I was in any way good at. Um, <laughs> but what I guess I would suggest is finding a healthy weight um, and holding it for as minimum 
a time as possible and then making sure that you'll give your body time to recover afterwards in terms of, of regaining a healthy weight, regaining menstrual cycle if that's stopped in that buildup because I think that's important. Mm. Um, so it's really, again, working with the medical side, working with the physiologists and just making sure that mm. you're looking after the athlete's long-term health and strength. Mm -hmm. And yes, there might be short periods, but I wouldn't try and hold those for too long and certainly not with developing athletes going through puberty still. No, that's well, excellent. And, I, and, um, I, do, I do have a comment there in terms of yeah. um, high jump is different than weight class sport athletes because they have to compete at their weight, so to speak. There's no way in process. Um, so there's no ability to rehydrate or glycogen reload like we would see in MMA. That said, mm -hmm. eliminating fiber, which is heavy in the gut content, um, can be a source of, of body mass that is non-functional. So you want to make sure that you have glycogen stores. You want to make sure hydration is is peaked up. You know, potentially um, you ensure your your creatine reserves are are high for that alactic type activity. Um, but fiber manipulation that we see in MMA could have an application to the sport of high jump or really any of your jumping sports. Okay. All right. That's that's sounds absolutely great advice. Um, and and I was going to say, Clint has already warned us we should be looking at good qualified um, uh, advice, nutritionists, dietitians, uh, whatever's relevant there. Is he time for one more, or how are we doing? Um, well, well we're, we're we're running um, about sort of ten minutes over, and I'm, I'm mindful that our panel have generously given up their time. If um, people are happy for one more, I can squeeze it in. But otherwise, we can follow up with an email, and we can probably address all the all the questions better and in more detail. Then <laughs> I was going to say that that might rather than rush something because this is such an important topic. Um, I think probably the easiest thing is if I actually. Um, wrap up because I think we've heard some fantastic um, insights, information, guidance, warnings. Um, certainly, uh, it is quite mind blowing the the to see some of the uh, drastic actions that that are taken. And uh, I'm so glad that we've had this expert panel. And I think, you know, from what we've we've heard, we really should be repeating this. Um, on a regular basis to bring uh, these people together, you know. So I really want to thank every each and every one of you. It's been an absolutely fantastic insight. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike and Rhonda, for uh, um, for the for the medical input, for your the generosity of your thinking around, you know, how difficult it is because you have to pick up those pieces afterwards. And uh, um, uh, you know, all credit to you for. Um, for, for the work that you're doing there, both of you. Um, and, and a thank you to Kerith for the, you know, bearing your soul. It isn't easy. Um, and uh, I, I think it's an absolute, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, distinction that you actually want to come back and fight this with the vigor that you, you are. And thank you, Clint. Uh, you know, I just want to get there to that UFC Performance Institute and uh, um, I hope that I can, and uh, I, I'm certainly thinking of all sorts of things anti-doping that I can actually use from everything that you've all been saying. But a really big thank you to you, Paula. Uh, it's been such a long time since we've seen each other, and uh, I'm so glad that uh, you've actually got that perspective and and that that mum perspective as well, uh, because at the end of the day, you know, this is sport and there is life and that is so so mm -hmm. important thank you to our audience for staying with us um i think we haven't lost too many and many people are going to see this on catch up and we do have a little bit of work to do behind the scenes to be able to provide um some uh, information to you um to give you the links and uh, the answers to your questions so thank you to imaf for um uh, hosting this and uh we really do hope you all stay safe and uh, that we'll see you at another imaf event uh, through the week uh, if not we'll see you next time on imaf thought leadership thank you everybody thank you Michelle. thank, thank you, you.